Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jeremy Martins. I'm the host of today's webinar. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the custodians and traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. The Wajup Noonga people are the traditional owners of the land on which the Crawley campus of the University of Western Australia is situated. And the Wajup Noonga remain the spiritual and cus cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their value languages, beliefs, and knowledge. Um, I'm really pleased today to uh, welcome uh, Malcolm Albrook, who is going to be presenting uh, today. Before I uh, welcome uh, Malcolm uh, formally though, I'd just like to ask attendees um, to use the question and answer function uh, to post questions, uh, both during uh, the uh, webinar itself, but also um, uh, at the end. And then we'll be able to have a chance to uh, ask uh, Malcolm a whole a range of questions, hopefully. So Malcolm uh, Albrook is Managing Editor of the Australian Dictionary of Biography and a Research Fellow at the National Centre of Biography in the School of History at ANU. After working with na native title representative bodies in the Kimberley and the Pilbara, he completed his PhD at Griffith University in 2008. He has authored or co-authored four books, including Henry Princip's Empire, Framing a Distant Colony in 2014, as well as many articles and ADB biographies, notably on the ancient Australian figures, Lady Mungo and Mungo Man, the former Governor General and Cabinet Minister Sir Paul Haslack, and the historian and writer Dame Mary Durack. He is a CI on the ARC project, an Indigenous Australian Dictionary of Biography, led by UWA's, or formerly UWA's, Shino Kanishi, and as editor of the Australian Journal of Biography and History. Welcome, Malcolm. Um, thank you very much. And uh, today your paper is entitled Echoes of Slavery in the Colonization of Western Australia's North. And I pass over to you. Um, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much indeed for that very generous welcome. Um, I'd like to firstly pay tribute to the uh, traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting, which is Canberra, uh, the land of the Ngunnawal people. And I also want to pay tribute to the traditional owners of the Pilbara, uh, particularly as much of what I'm saying today comes from their country. It seems an extraordinary expression of cultural superiority and arrogance that by hoisting the flag at the mouth of the Swan River in 1829, the entire west coast of Australia became a British possession and its indigenous people, British subjects. 35 years later, the people of the Pilbara, 1700 kilometers and a long and hazardous sea voyage distant, encountered their new overlords for the first time, as without ceremony, a ragtag brigade of Europeans commenced the invasion of their lands. In 1863, the colonial government had advertised special land regulations and within two years, investors had claimed holdings and landed settlers, many from Victoria or the Avon Valley in the south, on Ngalama country at Tien Sin Harbour, which became Cossack in 1871. The numbers were at first small, but the process of dispossession and subjugation pitilessly efficient. At Iramagadu, 20 kilometres inland from Cossack, Robin was gazetted in 1866 and a government resident, Robert John Scholl, became the one man manifestation of colonial government. Within a few years, pastoral operations, mainly running sheep, had been established along the coast, north to the De Grey and south to the Ashburton. The nascent pastoral industry struggled, but the region's colonial fortunes were rescued by the rich pearling banks, and many of the pastoralists bought vessels in the race to make their fortunes. And the industry was indeed lucrative, by 1870, 80 boats were working the waters between Cossack and Roebuck Bay, now Broome, and the industry was worth over £80,000 annually. The labour needs of both industries were great. Within a few years, many of the coastal people had been brutalised or enslaved, while following the rivers, occupation of the inland proceeded apace, as the newcomers sought more land and combed the country for people to work the labour-hungry pearling fleet. In this paper, I will consider this process of subjugation and enslavement from its early wild years to the rigid legal strictures and bureaucratization that emerged during the early part of the 20th century. I'll briefly explore the potential of biography 
to portray the colonial outposts in the 19th century as one of vested interests overlaid by connections and relationships. The boundaries between the public and the private often blurred and permeable. Such conditions provided fertile ground for the subjugation of Aboriginal populations and acted to frustrate the half-hearted attempts of a faraway government to regulate the labour market and place Aboriginal people within a domain of colonial protection. I'll be focusing on Indigenous labour, the many Chinese and other Southeast Asian peoples who came to the Pilbara, working in the pearling industry and elsewhere, most under contracts of indenture, are another story. Firstly, a bit of orientation for those unfamiliar with the reason, region. And here, I have to confront the share screen issue. Is that showing, um, Jeremy? <laughs> I can't see it, Malcolm, unfortunately. Um, it. Well, look. It says um, we are viewing your screen, but for some reason. Mm. Um, I'm just going to have one more go, and then I, I'm, I'll abandon it. If it doesn't work. I haven't got time to mess around with it. Okay, well, unfortunately, you're not going to see um, any slides. Um, but what I was going to show was a, a, the well known IATSIS map, um, which shows that the Pilbara is a place of great cultural richness and diversity. A human history of many thousands of years is recorded in song and story, together with galleries of petroglyphs middens and standing stones, most famously at Murujuga, otherwise known as Burrup, which in January 2020 was nominated by the federal government for World Heritage Listing. The Pilbara is a place of great beauty and biodiversity, great vistas of iron rich ranges and plains, spinifex, white gum adorned river courses which flood and flow fast in the erratic wet, thunderstorms and rainbows, mangrove fringed coastal regions, huge tidal rushes, rocky islands and a wonderfully blue ocean which can quickly turn rough and destructive in the cyclone season. It can also be a hard country and extremely hot, boasting Australia's hot, hottest town marble bar. It's not a place to be caught outside without a hat and plenty of water. Gouged into this natural beauty, it is also a place where the Anthropocene is writ large by virtue of the almost unfathomably rich deposits of iron ore. Since 1968, this has made it Australia's richest industrial landscape. Everything about the Pilbara seems huge. Its ports, its railways and open cut mines. Industry on a massive scale. And if you encounter a monster iron ore train at a level crossing, you might as well turn off your engine and have a bit of a snooze. Now, consistent with this muscular and industrialized context, Pilbara history is often related as one of triumphalism and celebration, focusing on the industrial development of the last 50 years, or glorifying the pioneering spirit of those who opened up the country to pastoralism and pearling. There have though been some fine histories. Sue Jane Hunt in 1986, Kay Forrest in 1996, Anne Scringemore in 2020, and plenty of articles, for example, Tom Gara in 1983, Margaret Allen in 2001. And more from a discipline I personally find enormously enlightening, historical archaeology. And I here uh, draw attention to the output of Alistair Patterson, and uh, particularly his 2020, The Point of Pearling with Peter Beth, being particularly pertinent to this paper. There are also a number of good oral historical collections published by Wonkamaya Pilbara Aboriginal Language Centre, the lawyer and historian Noel Olive, and a series of publications on the history of Injibandi lands by Julu Walu, the Roban based Injibandi organisation. Yet there is a sense that the true history of the Pilbara has only partly been told. This led Wonkamaya in Port Hedland to initiate a project called Hidden Histories of the Pilbara in 2008. With Mary Ann Jebb, I have since worked with staff, board and members to develop a history that brings the Aboriginal side of the story into the mainstream. The project tells the difficult histories of invasion, massacre, loss, violence and enslavement 
while celebrating survival, cultural and linguistic renewal and recovery to title, of title to ancestral and traditional lands. We are inching towards publication of a book later this year, year under the title Blood Shadow, Hidden Histories of Pilbara. For Pilbara Aboriginal people, history is often hard and painful and might bring anger and bitterness at the inhumanity of, and violence of colonialism. It affects people directly because the rough days of the frontier are not that far distant and the legacies of colonialism have continued throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. The stolen generation, Aboriginal deaths in custody, government interventions into the private business of Aboriginal communities, and government sanctioned destruction of sacred and historically important sites. History lives in every family. Parents and grandparents are a direct and personal link to the past. Their memory is taking today's generations back to those hard times. The language of history often sanitizes and conceals the reality of the past. Euphemism and ambiguity casting a veneer over historical truth. People sometimes find it hard to dwell on the humiliation and shame of being a colonised people, often preferring to look to the future and overlook the negativity of the past. But when something happens to remind you of the past, like a death in police custody or the destruction of a priceless sacred and historical site, an encounter with history is unavoidable. So it is with the enslavement of the grandparents and great grandparents of today's generation an experience that in the Pilbara is leavened by the pride of the Pilbara Pastoral Workers' Strike of 1946 to 48, of casting off the burden of unfree labour, a story magnificently told by Anne Scrimgeour in Red Earth Walking. In its essential elements, the system of labour that emerged in the Pilbara was similarly dehumanising, violent and callous as the North Atlantic trade in the Caribbean. There were differences, of course, in that it was an indigenous population that was being enslaved and that the system of pastoral labor contracts might allow a marginally more humane environment at least for the aboriginal people prepared to accept their lot as chattels together with their loss of freedom of movement and association in exchange for a rudimentary form of pastoral protection yet as georgina arnott observed in last week's seminar we can see a continuum in methods and practice the system evolving in Western Australia bearing a striking resemblance to the North Atlantic and Caribbean. Emma Christopher pointed out in her seminar that the various forms and practices of slavery, broadly ch legal chattel slavery, debt slavery or indenture, were closely related to notions of the hierarchy of race, which saw Australian Aboriginal people close, place, close to the bottom of the chain of humanity. In the early days of the Pilbara pearling industry, we can see enslavement at its most brutalizing and inhumane. The industry had a voracious need for labor. Conditions were often dangerous and many pearling masters cared little for the welfare of their divers. The blackbirders, to use a contemporary term associated with the South Pacific slave trade, and just as an aside, I've mentioned the presence of the Melanie owned by Captain Robert Towns, which was actively involved in Pacific blackbirding in the Pilbara waters in 1869, indicating how lucrative the industry was, operated outside the rudimentary system of law and order by kidnapping Aboriginal men, women and children and selling them to pearling ship owners. Kay Porras calls them, and I quote, vicious and depraved men, and they became well known in the region for their activities. Their names were also well known, Robert Shea and Thomas Mountain being the most notorious, and they operated in the hinterland from the De Grey to the Ashburton, and as Patterson and Beth show, probably as far afield as the Kimberley. Forrest describes how, despite the illegality of his operation, Mountain became increasingly confident, as he would when his clients included the sons of the resident magistrate and the most influential pastorists, who were often also justices of the peace. Forrest writes, where once Mountain had operated in stealth along the byways, he and his men now rode openly down the common tracks, running the Aboriginals through Cossack and through Robin at night for, the, for imprisonment in the Cossack warehouse. He publicly advertised he would procure natives for five pounds and was prepared to shoot them for half a crown. Some chilling contemporary accounts show how the pastoralist pearlers and the slave drivers worked in tandem. 
In the 1870s, Julius Brockman, born and raised at Guildford in the Swan Valley in 1850, son of Robert Brockman and Elizabeth Walcott, worked for the Mackay family at the Mundabulangana station on the Yule River, a little south of present day Headland. In his diaries, published in 1987 as an edited collection called He Rode Alone, Brockman recalls his encounter with Shay, who had been sent by the Mackays to, quote, find native divers. At Strelly, Shay captured 16 men and boys who, when they realized they were bound for the pearling fleet, escaped during the night. Shay set off in pursuit to recapture them and was speared to death. Brockman, suspecting that this had happened, was sworn in as a special constable, knowing that without this status, and I quote, if we had fighting and I took part, I would be using arms illegally. And moreover, he knew, quote, that the psalm singers in Perth were eagerly watching for an opportunity for sensational cases from up here to brand the North unjustly. Catching up with the alleged perpetrators, the party held 70 men, women and children captive, shooting two who tried to escape. In the court case that followed, despite the illegality and brutality of Shay's operation, five Aboriginal men were hanged for his murder. Another account comes from Arnett Francisco in the libel case taken by John Gribble against the West Australian in 1887. In his short stay in Western Australia, as a missionary in the Gascoigne, 800 or so kilometres south of Robin, Gribble had antagonised the colonial establishment by pub publishing an account of the, quote, intolerable conditions under which Aboriginal people were exploited how they were, and I quote again, chained like so many dogs to each other around the neck and the, se the women sexually exploited. As has so often happened in Australian history though, it was Gribble who got the rough end of the deal as the WA establishment closed ranks. Having been called by the newspaper a lying, canting humbug, he sued the proprietors and the resultant Supreme Court hearing before the Indian-born Chief Justice Sir Alexander Onslow, who was formerly based in the British Honduras, was eagerly reported as something of a show trial. Appearing as a witness for Gribble, Francisco, formerly a pearler, clearly enjoyed being the centre of attention. His testimony was littered with jokes and laughter. He testified that Aboriginal people were hunted down for the pearling fleet, quote, in the same way as we go kangaroo hunting creeping up on them at night and hunting them down on horseback during the day. Thomas Mountain was the worst of them. After being picked up, they were marched to the coast, usually in chains and kept in a bonded warehouse at Cossack until they were sold to pearlers. On the boats, they were treated cruelly. And at the end of the season, they were left on Barrow or another island until the next season came around. Furthermore, it was common practice to include Aboriginal divers and crew as part of a sale, although it was never recorded. When Francisco had sold his pearling like a seven years before, he had got 440 pounds for it, but it would have been worth 1300 with the divers included. He testified that Aboriginal divers and crew were often branded like cattle with the symbol of their owner and murdered or drowned on boats for refusing to work. But again, According to the usual practice, Francisco's testimony was belittled by the prosecution and the West Australian, diminished by his admission that he now earned his keep as a card shark. As I mentioned at the, heart, at the start of this paper, the Office of Government resident, resident was at the heart of the system that both allowed and served to conceal the often brutal conditions of the northern uh, uh, province. Responsible to the governor through the office of the colonial secretary, the logistics of being in a place so distant from the seat of government dictated that day-to-day -day operations were largely at the discretion of the resident. And informally, his authority was effectively checked by his peers in the region who had it in their power through their economic capital to make or break officials and to boot often held their own powers as JPs, or after 1874, as parliamentarians. Scholl assumed the role in October 1865, a few months after the first Europeans had arrived to take up their selections. 
Born in London in 1819 and arriving in WA with his mother and two siblings when he was 21, Shoal was initially appointed government resident at the ill-fated Camden Harbour settlement on the North Kimberley coast in January 1865. Drawn by the rosy accounts of George Gray from his visit in 1838, a number of Victorian families sunk their savings into the venture, but within a few months it had collapsed. The victim of a devastating climate, land ill-suited to stock and agriculture, and sustained opposition to their presence from the Waroda landowners. Transferring to Tianjin Harbour, Scholl's powers as government resident were akin to those of a lieutenant governor. He was essentially responsible for all government functions for the entire Northern District, including day-to-day -day supervision of the police, although they were formally under the control of the Commissioner in Perth. He was also a resident magistrate and had the power to swear in justices of the peace. Furthermore, under the 1849 Aboriginal Native Offenders Ordinance, he or any J JP for that matter, could deal summarily with offences such as sheep or cattle killing, provided the offender was Aboriginal. And he had another crucial power, that of swearing in special constables in order to, and I quote, suppress any tumult, riot or affray or any other emergency for the preservation of public peace. This meant that any white man could become a police officer, which, as Brockman had written, licensed them to use firearms without any fear of prosecution. Over his 15-year tenure, Scholl used these extensive powers to exert and maintain control over Aboriginal people of the region. The Imperial Masters and Servants Act and the Breach of Contract Act of 1842 allowed him to compel Aboriginal people to remain on stations or in the vicinity of ration depots. Much of the police action against Aboriginal people, the Cossack and Robe and Occurrence books are full of such cases, was to enforce the system of indenture under which Aboriginal people were bound to a station owner under an unwittingly entered contract of labour, which meant they could be charged with absconding and chased down if they left the station. Although they were called contracts, the actual paperwork seems to have consisted of a list submitted to the resident magistrate, the names often given by the station owner against which the worker might make a cross. Characterized as an indenture, the reality was that in many places they were chattels, their value as labor added to that of the land and infrastructure in any future transfer. For Aboriginal people living outside the station or the town economy, the harsh guardianship of the government resident was replaced by an active and aggressive intervention designed to crush Aboriginal resistance. At least twice in 1868 and 69, Scholl authorised large scale expeditions against Aboriginal people and swore in settlers as special constables to attack populations at Murujuga, a flying firm on the Burrup Peninsula, and Mindaroo in the Ashburton, killing some and imprisoning others. Both posses exacted fearful vengeance on the local people. It will never be known how many died in the vicinity of flying foam. Heavily armed land and sea parties launched concurrent attacks and over a number of days shot and killed many people, decimating the population of Yabarara people whose traditional country Murujuga was. At Mindaroo, the traditional country of the Thalangi operation, land later taken over by the Forest family, the police party launched a two-week rampage of violence, and by Scholl's own account, at least 21 people died. He never seems to have been called to account by his government masters for this violence, his defence being that police intervention was preferable to leaving settlers to take matters into their own hands. And indeed, he may have had a perverse point, judging by the reputations of some of the pastoral and pearly protagonists of the region. Scholl eventually lost the confidence of his superiors in Perth, largely because his financial and family interests in Perling prevented him from carrying out their orders to clean up the slave trade on the fleet. Indeed, Governor Weld described Scholl in a communication to Secretary of State Kimberley as a, quote, disgrace to the British name. In 1881, he was forced to resign and, embittered, retired to Perth, where he died five years later. We could easily leave Scholl's legacy there, judging him as one who could have stood up to the vested interests in his jurisdiction 
done more to suppress the trade in human labor and reduce the violence and aggression in a nascent sphere of government, but did none of these things because of his own financial and family interests. Yet, if historians are to use microhistorical methodologies like biography to consider a harsh frontier, they must go beyond the temptation to cast historical actors such as Scholl as two-dimensional figures, and instead seek to consider a life such as his in its full frame. It helps, of course, that Scholl left a body of correspondence that allows us to meld his life story into the larger context at the local, colonial, and even imperial levels. Much of his writing is official, daily occurrence books, correspondence in and out of the colonial secretary's office. But Scholl also diligently maintained a journal, which he perhaps never intended to become public. The fact that all of this material ended up in the state records office in w of WA is manner to a historian. For his parallel documents, they helped to present Scholl not only Excuse me, as the efficient and often ruthless official, but as a man of emotion who worried about the morality of his actions and how they might be seen by his superiors, as well as by future directions. For his life at Robin was often difficult. He suffered from painful infections and illnesses and lived in a permanent state of misery and grief after the death at sea of his oldest son, Treverton in 1867, and he was not the only one to suffer. He fretted about the mental health of his wife, Mary Ann, identified simply as Mrs. S, his own domestic unfree labor, who emerges as one desperately miserable in the heat, boredom, and monotony of life in the small settlement. At the level of the individual, biography can generate sympathy, complicating the motivations and aspirations of those who might otherwise be judged harshly. Enlightening those it can be biographical, biographical work has inherent limitations. How much can an individual life tell us about a complex region such as the Pilbara? The minutiae of everyday life, interest, interesting though it might be to a biographer, might seem inconsequential to anyone else. More seriously, biography tends to privilege those with literary and cultural capital, like Henry Princep, the subject of my 2014 book, Henry Princep's Empire. The judgment of history has not been particularly kind to Princep, the man who was chief protector of Aborigines for a decade between 1898 and 1907, single-mindedly drove what became the Aborigines Act 1905. Princep never visited the Pilbara, but under the regimes of his successors, notably A.O. Neville, the laws he designed and piloted through Parliament over the next 70 years came to have a devastating and pervasive impact on the lives of Aboriginal families throughout the state. A member of the Anglican Synod and the mission committee that employed Gribble, Princep saw himself as an avowed humanitarian. He envisaged his laws as heralding a new protectorate for the preservation of what he deemed would otherwise have been a dying race. In this, he was at odds with his boss, Sir John Forrest, one of the many false prophets who told Princep that governments had a responsibility only to do just enough to smooth their passing and to ensure that they should serve the higher civilization before they went. By casting those such as Scholl and Princep as links in local and global networks, we can learn much about the emergence of colonies such as Western Australia and of its regions such as the Pilbara. This though implies a shift in focus from the individuals the collective and the kinds of values, characteristics and interests that connect people in interest groups over time and space. Collective biography of the kind made possible by the indexing functions of the ADB, the Australian Dictionary of Biography, by which we can search the 35,000 odd biographical entries over uh, uh, three main sites, allows us to organize group biographical information according to a whole range of demographic and social features, characteristics and interests. It can reveal a lot more about a region like the Pilbara than a painstakingly assembled individual biography. Furthermore, it can suggest directions for future microhistorical research.
We might, for example, look at the small group of humanitarians who occupied government posts and sought to suppress enslavement and regulate Aboriginal labour on the Pearling Fleet. Men such as Pemberton Walcott, Edward Hayes Lawrence and Edward Fox Angelo each held official positions during and after the regime of Shoal, and each sought to enforce the Pearl Shell Fisheries Act 1871, enacted to regulate Aboriginal enslavement on the Pearling Fleet. The Hansard record of the Legislative Council debate on the legislation, which had been proposed by the Governor Frederick Weld, reads almost like a lunch club debate at the Weld Club, which indeed is not far from the truth. Even the bill's proponent, Colonial Secretary Frederick Barley, seemed to hold little hope that the bill would be effective. And why would he? Most of the members appointed or elected were drawn from the landowning elite of the colony. And although the North did not have a representative until 1874, they well understood and sympathised, and had probably grown up or been to school with the landowners and businessmen of the Pilbara. Yet Walcott, Lawrence and Angelo all seem to have been prepared to oppose these vested interests. We've met P Pemden Walcott before, as one identified by Jane Lydon as having British Guianian and Jamaican slave owning antecedents, with family members on both his mother's and his father's side who received compensation. How much of this wealth flowed through to Western Australia is not known. Having been involved in expeditions to the Pilbara as a young man, Walcott was an appointed inspector of pearl shell fisheries in 1880 by Governor William Robinson with instructions to clean up the industry. Boris speculates that he was too effective, threatened with vested interests too uh, penetratingly and that his death at Roebuck Bay in 1883 was due to poisoning. Edward Hay Lawrence, Hayes Lawrence and I had wanted to show a wonderful pen and ink sketch by his friend Henry Princep may also have slave owning connections. A number of Lawrences appear in the LBS database, although he was born in London in 1846. Cousin of Colonial Secretary Barley, he succeeded Scholl as resident magistrate at Robin in 1881. Like Walcott, he, uh, he died young, just uh, four years after going to, um, uh, to Robin. Um, Edward Fox Angelo, born in India in 1836, had served in the Indian Army before coming to Western Australia in 1882. He succeeded Lawrence's RM at Robin in 1886, um, appointed by Governor Sir Frederick Broom. Like his predecessor, he was appalled at conditions on the Pearling Fleet. Writing to Broom, he reported finding in full force, I now quote here, a disguised and unquestionable form of slavery carried out under the protection of the British flag. Most of the Pilbara pastoralists of the 19th century seem to be rough and hard types, such as the Mackays at Mundabulangana, who became known for their violence and abuse of Aboriginal people. Yet the MacLeod family upsets this image. Arriving in the Pilbara as investors in the Victorian-based Denison Plain Company, Donald MacLeod soon abandoned the pursuit to return to the safer environment of Victoria. Returning to Western Australia in 1899, he took up land in the Gascoigne and with his wife, Charlotte, née Bustle, set about establishing a station at Manilia on the banks of the Gascoigne River. As a fellow humanitarian and as chief protector, his kinsman, Henry Princep, approved of MacLeod's practices. In his 1901-02 annual report, Princep wrote that, quote, a large number of natives congregate at the station, and no wonder they have found out that they receive kindness and justice with liberality. The children are clothed, and all the natives are compelled to wash themselves in their clothes and keep their hair short and to appear weakly in a clean condition. This was the kind of protection Princep had in mind. For the enslaved, though, biographical approaches are far more difficult. And indeed, the individual focus of biography seems almost the antithesis of the dehumanizing imperative of enslavement. Marina Carter, in her 1996 book, Voices from the Indenture, took up the challenge of giving voice to the voiceless in her study of Indian indentured laborers. 
like Carter's subjects, the Aboriginal enslaved and the pastoral and pearling industries, only become visible at the flashpoints of conflict with the law or boss. And even then, because authorities rarely made an effort to familiarize themselves with Aboriginal naming conventions, it is difficult for their descendants to identify or claim them from the vantage point of over a century. Yet the principles of collective biography give license to multidisciplinary approaches and archeology, span anthropology and linguistics combined with Aboriginal knowledges can reveal much about life paths and life courses, even if the individual remains beyond reach. Apart from the violence and aggression that underlies the history of the Pilbara frontier, to me, the story of enslavement in this West Australian outpost is one of suspicion, concealment and vested interest, where those in the North, the perpetrators of an inhumane trade, did everything they could to conceal their practices from a faraway government which they believed had no conception of the difficulties they faced. Not only was the government personified by the governor and senior Perth-based officials, such as the colonial secretary or the chief protector of Aborigines, believed to be out of touch, there was a more general disdain for humanitarians, as they were known, the Exeter Hall types and the psalm singers. For its part, the government was also complicit in this game of deceit, as it taught, sought to convince London that the colony was ready for self-government. Both officials and pastoralists who increasingly came to dominate the Legislative Council were part of this deceit. And all of them came down hard on those who broke the rules and went public about the slavery on the frontier. Another possible collective, men like Gribble, David Carley, Lyon Weiss, Walter Malcolmson, and the Catholic Bishop, Matthew Gibney. The fears of the colonial government appeared justified when self-government finally came in 1890 and London withheld responsibility for Aboriginal affairs, much to the resentment of John Forrest, who immediately set about having the measures revoked, which they were in 1898 after the Legislative Council passed its Aborigines Protection Act and set up a rudimentary protectorate. The three-man Aborigines department, underfunded and with no powers, was never intended to be effective. But Princep, well-connected and sociable, was an effective communicator. And over the next few years, the taint of slavery steadily diminished to be replaced by the veneer of protection. When Princep and his wife Josephine, née Bustle, took a holiday back in England in 1907, over 40 years after he had left the country, on a mission to rescue the estates of his Calcutta-based father, Charles, he was called on to attend a meeting with the Secretary of State, Lord Elgin, to explain and justify the state's continued use of neck chains to restrain and transport Aboriginal prisoners. Turning up at Westminster, Princep found that Elgin was unavailable and instead he met a middle ranking civil servant who Princep reported had little inkling of what he was talking about, and indeed, I quote, seemed surprised that I spoke English. Back in Perth, he told the West Australian that, quote, apart from a very small missionary set, the English were, quote, so wrapped up in their affairs, the affairs of their own country, that they do not trouble themselves about our native question. Thus reassured, the state government moved into a new stage of Aboriginal Affairs Administration, based on tight regulation, segregation and control, managed by the ruthless and efficient bureaucrat A.O. Neville. The taint of slavery steadily became a problem of the past, although every now and again there were outbursts of controversy, most of it short-lived and rapidly suppressed. The pearling industry too moved into a new phase as the fleet moved north to Broome and with the shallow banks fished out, demanded deep diving and new technologies. The system of Aboriginal pastoral labour, though, continued virtually unchanged and unabated right through until the beginning of the pastoral workers' strike in 1946, when a large proportion of Aboriginal people in the Pilbara walked off the job. This signalled the new era, the beginning of the end of a long period of enslavement and the start of the era of self-determination. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Let me just switch on my um, video. Um, that was a fascinating, uh, stimulating, although also troubling um, paper. 
but uh, thank you very much for um, a wonderful presentation. Um, I will start uh, with a question and I just wanted to encourage everybody else to please um, post their questions in the Q&A function uh, so that I can read them out and uh, uh, Malcolm can answer them. So I guess my question, my first question is, to what extent did Scholl admit that a system of slavery existed in Western Australia's north? And how did he rationalize the kidnapping, buying and selling of indigenous people? Um, Jeremy, it's a really good question. I mean, firstly, before I go on, I'd like to just apologize for the breakdown in technology, despite having tried numerous times and got it working in tip-top condition, it failed us. So uh, I finished a bit early and you missed out seeing five or six good photos. But yeah, to answer that uh, question, uh, Scholl really doesn't seem to have uh, engaged with the subject at all. Um, uh, in his uh, current books, the cur uh, current books are just, you know, very matter of fact reporting of day-to-day -day events. Uh, his journals are a bit more reflective, but um, you know he doesn't talk about slavery, and he uh, certainly doesn't really engage with the problem of the uh, of the Perling fleet. And of course, he had these uh, vested interests through his sons, and I think he also invested personally in the uh, in the fleet. The um, salary of the resident magistrate of the um, government resident was actually quite low. And I think it was specifically designed to uh, be a part-time position, perverse as it might seem, considering the incredible responsibilities of the position. So, you know, uh, people throughout, uh, resident magistrates throughout the colony were always looking for other financial interests. And I guess uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, what Scholl found himself doing. He, uh, his sons made a lot of money out of, the, uh, out of the, their pearling interests and went on indeed to become members of the Legislative Council to run commercial businesses and those kind of things. But, you know, throughout his, it's a very peculiar thing that despite all this controversy and this, uh, you know, that was swirling around him, he seems to have remained almost uh, immune from it. Um, although there are signs, as I said, that um, um, he worried about his legacy. Uh, he uh, seems to have uh, played a kind of sleight of hand by uh, uh, concealing a lot of material in his official reports, but placing them in his uh, personal journals, which makes it all the more surprising, I think, uh, that uh, his personal journal ended up in the same place as all his official reports. Um, so we can see this personal side of Scholl uh, that otherwise is missing. So yes, he's a, he's a, a really strange uh, and elusive character when it comes to uh, these kind of matters. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Jane has uh, posted a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Malcolm. Fascinating to see the link to the first settlers continuing in their movement northward. You, notice, you noted a couple of these with links to LBS, the Walcotts and others, suggesting that there were probably more. To what extent do you think this northern push mirrored the earlier processes uh, on Noongar country in the vicinity of Perth and Albany, et cetera? Oh, very, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm uh, picking up on your uh, uh, seminar, Jeremy. Um, the links between the Avon Valley and uh, the Pilbara uh, uh, appear all the time. You know, I think particularly of a, of a guy like Lockyer Claire Burgess, who uh, you know, had his antecedents in the Avon Valley and probably learnt a lot about uh, uh, warfare against uh, uh, the Noongar, um, you know, as he later replied when he came to the Pilbara. Um, so I think you can see continuities in the kind of men, and they were largely men, uh, who came to the Pilbara. And, uh, you know, a lot of them have been hardened, I think, by uh, their experiences of warfare uh, in the South. And uh, they applied it quite vigorously and ruthlessly when they came to the Pilbara. Um, uh, as far as the connections with the LBS database goes, I mean, to me, that's a really fascinating 
uh, but uh, uh, um, demanding uh, direction uh, to travel in. I was really interested, for example, that, that um, many of the uh, uh, Europeans who came to the Pilbara had no connections. They don't appear anywhere in the database. Um, but the middling, middling officials and uh, humanitarians sometimes do, um, although it's often difficult to connect them and it's certainly very difficult to follow the money trail. Um, although I noticed that the recent uh, uh, digitization of Bank of Western Australia details by the Reserve Bank, which uh, we were informed of yesterday, might provide some tantalizing examples of the movement of money around the empire. Um, that could be a forlorn hope. Um, but Lawrence was the other one, uh, uh, Edward Clues Lawrence, who, you know, it's, his name is spelt in an unusual way. It's L A U R E N C E, you know, somewhat unusual, but not, uh, you know, but tantalizing in its connections to the many Lawrences in uh, Barbados and Jamaica who uh, were compensated for, um, for slavery. Uh, ownership of slavery. And I think also when you think of people like uh, uh, the Princeps, I think are a great example. You know, they're, while they didn't necessarily have connections to the West Indies, they did have connections to other centers of unfree labor, such as India. Um, there they were disguised under contracts of indenture, but it was unfree labor nonetheless. Um, the uh, William Princep, uh, Henry Princep's uncle, was involved in moving in indentured um, um, Indians to uh, Mauritius. And, uh, you know, so I think what we're seeing is these, this network of uh, connections all around the empire uh, based on people smuggling or people moving, essentially. Thank you. Actually, that uh, just your, the last part of your answer there t uh, ties into what Georgie Arnott has, has uh, asked. She says, thank you, Malcolm. Did the Princeps talk about slavery and how did they distinguish their plans for indentured labor from slavery? So I guess that's a, that's a, a question to <laughs> perhaps elaborate on that last point you just made. Yes, yes. Well, they do. They certainly talk about slavery, the foul traffic of slavery, as they, they call it, you know. And, but I, I, don't, I don't really, I, I need to follow this through a little bit more because, uh, you know, there, were, there, were, there was antagonism, I think, between um, the... Uh, East India Company uh, commercial interests and uh, the West Indian commercial interests. And um, I'm not, I don't fully understand it, but, you know, I think people like John Princep, Henry Princep's grandfather, um, moved people around. He made, they made vast amounts of money in India um, as, um, as East India Company operatives or associated with the East India Company and uh, this allowed them to invest heavily in uh, fleets, um, particularly after they uh, moved back to England after very lengthy periods in India. And um, uh, these fleets, uh, you know, moved people. There's uh, evidence, uh, uh, very scanty evidence, but there is evidence that they were involved in the movement of um, uh, slaves from the East African coast to, uh, to Mauritius and Madagascar, uh, that they were involved in convict transport to Australia. Um, and uh, far more apparent is that uh, they were moving indentured uh, servants from uh, India to the sugar plantations in the Indian Ocean. So, you know, it's a bit difficult to determine their attitude. On the surface, they were sort of, you know, on the fringes of uh, the Clapham sect, I guess. You know, they were sort of humanitarians, but really a cute brand of humanitarianism that I don't fully understand, I can tell you. Um, so, yeah, a very, uh, un a very ambiguous answer, I'm afraid, Georgie. Thank you. Uh, Rob Smith has just written, I'm transcribing and publishing all of Scholl's official and unofficial correspondence uh, from his appointment to Camden Harbour uh, to his death, and the first half will be published in 2022. He had been liberal for his time before his appointment, as can be seen by his friends and his writings as editor of the Enquirer newspaper. Bishop Hale gave him the diary he took to Camden. He had close dealings with Barley and Rowe, 
through his membership of the Swan River Mechanics Institute. There is a lot to the man and maybe the best part of him died with Treverton. Very interesting comment. I mean, that, that's my point as well. And I think that, you know, it's, it's easy to damn someone like Scholl uh, to present him as a, a sort of, you know, a two dimensional character. But, you know, if you look into his, um, his writings, which there are a large, uh, there's a large quantity, then you see, you, you can't help but sympathize. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a really hard thing. It doesn't excuse the uh, kind of uh, acts that he was involved in and, you know, the kind of damnation that he faced, if you like, from, you know, his superiors later in his career. Uh, the uh, interesting comment that after Treverton, he sort of, you know, sunk into despondency. And I think you see that a lot, particularly in his journals. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing a transcription, a new transcription of the journals, um, as, as well as his occurrence books. So, you know, because, you know, they are they're really interesting, uh, presenting a character, as I said, like Scholl in, uh, in his full frame. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If, uh, if there are, please quickly um, uh, type them up so that I can ask a question uh, on, on Rob's... Uh, oh, here we go. Sven Osman, more comment than a question, but the tensions, tensions within the colonial invader community on what was considered allowable and illegal treatment of Aboriginal people is an interesting nuancing of what can sometimes be a very polarised characterization, characterization, often with reason. Yeah, good comment. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting, just uh, I would like to just remind everyone who's listening that, uh, of course, next week we have another uh, webinar. Um, and the uh, title of that is The National Biographies and Transnational Lives, Legacies of British Slavery Across the, the Empire. And Zoe Laidlaw and Georgina Arnott are going to be presenting that next week. So. Um, hoping everyone will be able to uh, sign up and register for that and uh, look forward to seeing you all again uh, at the same time next week. Um, and I'd like to just thank you, Malcolm, once more for a really, really stimulating paper, uh, nuanced, thoughtful, uh, and something I think we, we'll all um, uh, think about, it, you know, in the days to come. So thank you very, very much. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, who listened and also who've asked questions and I look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy.